Residing here in Paris as a young man, I became acquainted with a Monsieur Edgar Allan Poe, a writer. The writer. Our first meeting was at an obscure library in the Rue Montmartre, where the accident of our both being in search of the same rare and very remarkable volume, <laughs> books have remained my sole luxury, brought us into close communion. We met again and continued to enjoy the mutual pleasure of each other's company. He confessed to me, openly, that he felt his soul enkindled by the ardour, as he said, and the living freshness of my imagination. <laughs> my imagination. And so it was at length arranged that we should live together during his stay in the city. And as his worldly circumstances were somewhat less embarrassed than my own, he was permitted to be at the expense of renting and furnishing in a style which suited the rather fantastic gloom of our common temper, this time-eaten and grotesque mansion, long deserted through superstitions into which we did not inquire, and tottering to its fall in a retired and desolate portion of the Faubourg Saint-Germain. It was a freak of fantasy in me, for what else should I call it, to be enamoured of the night for her own sake. And into this bizarrerie, as into all my others, he quietly fell, giving himself up to his wild whims with a perfect abandon. The sable divinity would not herself dwell with us always, but we could counterfeit her presence. At the first dawn of the morning, we closed all the massy shutters of our old building, lighted a couple of tapers, which, strongly perfumed, threw out only the ghastliest and feeblest of rays. By the aid of these, we then busied our souls in dreams, reading, writing, or conversing, until worried by the clock of the advent of the true darkness. Then we sallied forth into the streets of Paris. Arm in arm, we continued the topics of the day, or roamed far and wide until a late hour, seeking amid the wild lights and shadows of the populous city that infinity of mental excitement which quiet observation can afford. For I boasted that in respect to myself, most men wore windows in their bosoms. <laughs> and so we would meet and walk, taking pleasure in the riches of each other's minds, the American and the Frenchman, Mr. Edgar Allan Poe, and the Chevalier Charles-Auguste Dupin. Kerry Shale plays Edgar Allan Poe, with John Moffat as Charles-Auguste Dupin, in Christopher Cook's tale of mystery and imagination, The Strange Case of Edgar Allan Poe. But Edgar Allan Poe is dead. And I should mourn a noble soul, a friend and my companion in detection, whose pen was ever at my service. Together we unraveled the affair of the Rue Morgue and the mystery attending the murder of Marie Roger, shining the cold, clear light of reason upon dark and fearful ignorance. And yet I know as I ever knew that the soul of my friend was more than half in love with the dark and fearful, with the nightmare, not the light of waking. I would unravel the mystery of his death. Found alone in another man's clothes, stripped of reason in the Baltimore streets and dead on the third day, 
and I would penetrate the mystery of his life. Forty years with only that terrible imagination for company, that same imagination which compelled him to live his death a hundred times. Lo, tis a gale and night within the lonesome latter years. An angel throng, bewinged, bedight in veils and drowned in tears, sit in a theater to see a play of hopes and fears, while the orchestra breathes fitfully the music of the spheres. Edgar Allan Poe, born into the theater, forever acting out the entrances and exits of your troubled soul. Do you hear it? Yes, I hear it. Now as never before. Many days I have heard it, yet I dared not. Oh, pity me, miserable wretch that I am. I dared not speak. Speak what? Usher, I am your friend, the mirror of your tormented soul. We have put her living in the tomb. We have buried her before that blessed heart had beat its last. But who? Who? She! The Lady Madeleine! Madman! Usher, your own sister! I tell you, she now stands without the door. She is alive! Yet she is dead! Richmond Inquirer, 10th of December, 1811. Died on last Sunday morning, Mrs. Elizabeth Poe, one of the actresses of the company at present playing on the Richmond boards. By the death of this lady, the stage has been deprived of one of its chief ornaments. Hear the tolling of the bells, iron bells. What a world of solemn thought their melody compels. First was your mother. Dead when I was scarcely three years of age, Dupin, with a beauty made the more luminous by consumption. Ligeia? Without Lygia, I was but a child, groping, benighted. Hers was the radiance of an opium dream, an airy and a spirit-led vision. Madeline Usher? The body of the Lady Madeleine, having been encoffined, we two alone bore it to its rest, and having deposited our mourned burden upon trestles within the vault, this region of sorrow, we partially turned aside the yet unscrewed lid of the coffin and looked upon the face of the tenant. Annabel Lee? And the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee in the sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. Then there was my adopted father, 
John Allen. A Virginia merchant who provided an education, but little love and less money. <laughs> I was a poor investment for this man who took me into his house, Dupin. A dreamer, never ready for the counting house stool. Edgar does nothing and seems quite miserable, sulky and ill-tempered to all the family. How we have acted to produce this is beyond my conception. I am a businessman. I am a methodical man. Method is the thing, after all. If there is anything on earth I hate, it is a genius. Your geniuses are all errant asses. You cannot make a man of business out of a genius. Now I am a regular businessman. Had I done my duty as faithfully to my God as I have done to Edgar, then had death come when he will, he had no terrors for me. But I must end this with a, a devout wish that God may yet bless him. Helen Stannard? Helen, whose beauty is to me like those Nicaean barks of yore that gently or a perfumed sea the weary, wayworn wanderer bore to his own native shore. Helen was the first, Helen Stannard, mother of a school friend, and dead from a tumour upon the brain. Then, Elmira. was a child, and she was a child, in this kingdom by the sea. Elmira? Elmira Royster. Ah, the unanswered letters which you saw as unrequited love, as Alan packed you off to the university in Virginia. Even then, my friend, your passion for the unattainable gave your family cause for alarm, and you, pleasure? But the letters, and what letters? <laughs> Byron. Not yet, Poe. But my letters of love never saw Elmira's hand, never reflected my beloved's face. O oh, desperate seas, long wont to roam, thy hyacinth hair, thy classic face, thy naiad airs have brought me home to the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. <laughs> At university, I divided my time, after the custom of the undergraduates, between the recitation room, the punch bowl, the card table, athletic sports, and pedestrianism. Both in drinking and in card playing, I acted capriciously, and either was or affected to be the creature of impulse. So... You have kept me pitifully short of the financial wherewithal, wherein that to play my part as a true student here, I am obliged to hire a servant, to pay for wood, for washing, and a thousand other necessities. Books must be had if I intend to remain at the institution. <laughs> I call God to my witness that I never loved dissipation. Those who know me know that my pursuits and habits are very far from anything of the kind. But I was, I was drawn into it by my companions. I then became desperate and gambled until I finally involved myself irretrievably. From a memoir of my friend Edgar Allan Poe by the Chevalier Charles Auguste Dupin. Was Edgar a dandy and a wastrel? John Allen, a prudent merchant, tight of pocket, decided it was so and extracted the young man from the university, roundly and publicly berating him for his extravagance. It was in March of 1827 that Poe could endure it no longer. Sir! My determination is at length taken to leave your house and endeavour to find some place in this wide world where I will be treated not as you have treated me. Mm. 
United States Army Post, May 26, 1827. Name? Edgar A. Perry. Age? 22. Hmm? 22. Height? 5 foot 8 inches. Color of eyes? A gray. Color of hair? Brown. Complexion? A fair. Term of enlistment? Five years. Edgar A. Perry. A new name for a new man. Oh, Edgar, Edgar. Always in search of the perfect part and ready to try on any costume for size. In my imagination, Dupin, I ranged the world, sailed the oceans, crossed the continent. But St. Petersburg, Poe, St. Petersburg. In my imagination. In fact, I traveled no further than the United States artillery, and then to the military academy at West Point in the summer of 1830. But Merchant Allen still refused to support me in the manner befitting a southern gentleman. I have a very excellent standing in my class, in the first section in everything, and have great hopes of doing well. I have spent my time very pleasantly hitherto, but the study requisite is incessant, and the discipline exceedingly rigid. Charge one, gross neglect of duty. Charge second, disobedience of orders. Specification first. The said cadet Paul being directed by the officer of the day to attend church on the 23rd of January 1831 did fail to obey such order. Specification second. In this, that he, the said cadet Paul, did fail to attend the academy on the 25th of January 1831, having been directed to do so by the officer of the day. <laughs> to John Allen. Sir, I left West Point two days ago and traveling to New York without a cloak or any other clothing of importance. I have caught a most violent cold and am confined to my bed. I have no money, no friends. I shall never rise from my bed. Besides a most violent cold on my lungs, my ear discharges blood and matter continually, and my headache is distracting. Please send me a little money, quickly. Lo, death has reared himself a throne in a strange city, lying alone far down within the dim west, where the good and the bad and the worst and the best have gone to their eternal rest. There, shrines and palaces and towers, time-eaten towers that tremble not, resemble nothing that is ours. Around, by lifting winds forgot, resignedly beneath the sky, the melancholy waters lie. I am young, not yet twenty, am a poet, if deep worship of all beauty can make me one, and wish to be so in the more common meaning of the word. I would give the world to embody one half the ideas afloat in my imagination. So, my friend, if not the military man of action you once aspired to be, you embarked upon a career as a man of letters. Eternal night continued to envelop us, all unrelieved by the phosphoric sea brilliancy to which we had been accustomed in the tropics. We observed, too, that although the tempest continued to rage with unabated violence, there was no longer to be discovered the usual appearance of surf or foam which had hitherto attended us. The committee had about made up their minds that there was nothing before them to which they would award a prize, when I noticed a small quarto-bound book that had until then accidentally 
escaped detention. A scream from my companion broke fearfully upon the night. Casting my eyes upwards, I beheld a spectacle which froze the current of my blood at a terrific height directly above us, and upon the very verge of the precipitous descent hovered a gigantic ship of perhaps 4,000 tons. Her bows were alone to be seen as she rose slowly from the dim and horrible gulf beyond her. For a moment of intense terror, she paused upon the giddy pinnacle as if in contemplation of her own sublimity, then trembled and tottered and came down. The first tale finished, manuscript found in a bottle, I went on to the second, and to the next, and did not stop until I had gone through the volume, interrupted only by such exclamations as capital, excellent, and the like from my companions. There was genius in everything they listened to. And a literary prize. Yes, and work. Work in the gift of one of the judges. I returned to Richmond, Virginia. The prodigal returned, a literary hero, assistant editor of the Southern Literary Messenger. I had vanquished the merchant John Allen. But you were alone. From childhood's hour, I have not been as others were. I have not seen as others saw. I could not bring my passions from a common spring. From the same source, I have not taken my sorrow. I could not awaken my heart to joy at the same tone and all I loved. I loved alone. In my childhood, in the dawn of a most stormy life, was drawn from every depth of good and ill the mystery which binds me still from the torrent or the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rolled in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by, from the thunder and the storm and the cloud that took the form when the rest of heaven was blue of a demon in my view. I am a man of reason, taking pleasure in the patient application of logical thought. There are no mysteries, but simply problems awaiting a rational solution. And yet, when I reflect upon this part of Edgar Poe's brief life, I am compelled to admit that reason seems to have abdicated its high seat. Let me set down the facts as my friend chose to reveal them. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. At this time, the year was 1835, Poe was living alone in Richmond and pining for Virginia Clem. And this maiden, she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. Virginia was his cousin the daughter of Anna Maria Clem, that same Maria who later took it upon herself to act for my friend in his troubled dealings with editors and magazine proprietors. Virginia was scarcely 12 years old. I was a child, and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea, but we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee. More facts. 
Edgar proposed to marry his Virginia, but a cousin, Nielsen Poe, moved to stop the match. He and his wife would provide for Virginia in their own home. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabelle Lee, so that a high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. I am blinded with tears while writing this letter. I have no wish to live another hour. I love, dearest auntie, you know I love your Virginia passionately, devotedly. I cannot express in words the fervent devotion I feel towards my dear little cousin, my own darling. Our love, it is stronger by far than the love of those who are older than we, of many far wiser than we, and neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. Oh, auntie, auntie, you loved me once. How can you be so cruel now? You speak of Virginia acquiring accomplishments and entering into society. You speak in so worldly a tone. Are you sure she would be more happy? Do you think anyone could love her more dearly than I? She will have far, far better opportunities of entering into society here than with Nielsen Poe. Oh, ask Virginia. Leave it to her. My heart will break. But I will say no more. Kiss her for me a million times. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. For Virginia, my love, my own sweetest sissy, my darling little wifey, think well before you break the heart of your cousin, Eddie. I am a child, and you are a child in this kingdom by the sea, and we love with a love that is more than love. By these presents that a marriage is shortly intended to be had and solemnized between the above bound Edgar A. Poe and Virginia E. Clam of the city of Richmond. You loved her. As a sister. And as a bride? As a sister! James Fenimore Cooper, dear sir, I take the liberty of addressing you and of soliciting some little contribution to our southern literary messenger. I am aware that you are continually pestered with such applications, yet I owe it to the magazine and to my editor, Mr. Thomas White, to make the effort. Dear Edgar, that you are sincere in all your promises, I firmly believe. But Edgar, when you tread these streets, I have my fears that your resolves would fall through and that you would sip the juice, even till it stole away your senses. Separate yourself from the bottle, and bottle companions forever. No man is safe who drinks before breakfast. No man can do so and attend to business properly. I am your true friend, T.W. White, editor, The Southern Literary Messenger. <laughs> Rushing to the corpse, I saw, distinctly saw, a tremor upon the lips. <laughs> and now, slowly opened the eyes of the figure which stood before me. Here then, at least, I shrieked aloud, can I never be mistaken? These are the full and the black and the wild eyes of my last love, of the lady, of the lady, Ligia. <laughs> Edgar, there is no Ligia here. No tomb, no ancient upper room. 
No rich relics from past ages. We are in Paris. The Lady Ligia lives. It was the southern literary messenger that was dead. 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 I resigned. And wandered the face of American journalism, hunting a living for Virginia and her mother, and hoping to find yourself? Roderick Usher. Roderick Usher. Out, out, brief candle. During the whole of a dull, dark, and soundless day in the autumn of the year, when the clouds hung oppressively low in the heavens, I had been passing alone, on horseback, through a singularly dreary tract of country, and at length found myself, as the shades of the evening drew on, within view of the melancholy House of Usher. I reined my horse to the precipitous brink of a black and lurid tarn that lay in unruffled luster by the dwelling whose principal feature seemed to be that of an excessive antiquity. The discoloration of the ages had been great. Minute fungi overspread the whole exterior, hanging in a fine, tangled webwork from the eaves. Perhaps the eye of a scrutinizing observer might have discovered a barely perceptible fissure, which, extending from the roof of the building in front, made its way down the wall in a zigzag direction until it became lost in the sullen waters of the tarn. In this mansion of gloom, I now proposed to myself a sojourn of some weeks. Its proprietor, Roderick Usher, had been one of my boon companions in boyhood, but many years had elapsed since our last meeting. I rode over a short causeway to the house, a servant in waiting took my horse, and I entered the gothic archway of the hall. A valet of stealthy step thence conducted me in silence through many dark and intricate passages in my progress to the studio of his master. Surely man had never before so terribly altered in so brief a period as had Roderick Usher. The now ghastly pallor of the skin and the now miraculous luster of the eye, above all things, startled and even awed me. The silken hair, too, had been suffered to grow all unheeded, and as in its wild gossamer texture it floated rather than fell about his face, I could not, even with effort, connect its arabesque expression with any idea of simple humanity. Usher entered at some length into what he conceived to be the nature of his malady. It was, he said, a constitutional and a family evil, and one for which he despaired to find a remedy. He suffered much from a morbid acuteness of the senses. The most insipid food was alone endurable. He could wear only garments of certain texture, the odors of all flowers were oppressive, his eyes were tortured by even a faint light, and there were but peculiar sounds, and these from stringed instruments which did not inspire him with horror. I shall perish. I must perish in this deplorable folly. Thus... Thus, and not otherwise, shall I be lost. I dread the events of the future, not in themselves, but in their results. I shudder at the thought of any, even the most trivial incident, which may operate upon this intolerable agitation of soul. I, I have indeed no abhorrence of danger, except in its absolute effect. In 
terror. In this unnerved, in this pitiable condition, I feel that the period will sooner or later arrive when I must abandon life and reason together in some struggle with the grim phantasm. Fear. Prospectus of the Pan Magazine, a monthly literary journal to be edited and published in the city of Philadelphia by Edgar A. Poe. Dear sir, on the other leaf of this sheet you will find a prospectus of the Pan Magazine. Placed as you are, it is in your power to aid me most essentially, and I have every hope that you will be inclined to do so. My success depends mainly on the number of subscribers I may obtain before the 1st of December. December came and went. January, February, March, 1841 as well. And no pen magazine. Waiting. 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 My dear friend, I am sure you will pardon me for seeming neglect in not replying to your last letter when you learn what has been the cause of the delay. My dear little wife has been dangerously ill. About a fortnight since, in singing, she ruptured a blood vessel, and it was only on yesterday that the physicians gave me any hope of her recovery. But today the prospect brightens. I am rejoiced to say that my dear little wife is much better, and I have a strong hope of her ultimate recovery. She desires her kindest regards, as also my aunt, Maria, Mrs. Clem. Waiting. 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 Dear sir, I deem it to be my bounded duty to write to you this hurried letter in relation to our mutual friend Edgar Allan Poe. He arrived here in Washington a few days since to secure subscribers for his periodical, now to be called The Stylus and to press his suit further for a government appointment. On the first evening, he seemed somewhat excited, having been over-persuaded to take some port wine. On the second day, he kept pretty steady. But since then, he has been, at intervals, quite unreliable. Out! Out are the lights! Out all! And over each quivering form, the curtain, a funeral pall, comes down with the rush of a storm. And the angels, all pallid and wan, uprising, unveiling, affirm that the play is the tragedy, man, and its hero, the conqueror, worm. So, no preferment, no comfortable government sinecure, no stylus, and little work, and a sick wife, and nights filled with fear. As we walk now, friends, side by side through the middle watches of the night, you are calm. God in heaven, Dupin, you cannot begin to count the cost of these brief respites. So, why did you take ship to New York? What did you hope you would find there? Fame? <laughs> I did. 1844 was Edgar Allan Poe's Annus Mirabilis. Once, upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, Weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor," I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door, 
And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. The Raven is unique, singularly imaginative, and most musical. I send you an early copy of the Broadway Journal containing my Raven. The Raven has had a great run, but I wrote it for the express purpose of winning, just as I did my story The Gold Bug, you know. The bird beat the bug, though, all hollow. Edgar, I raise my glass to your triumph. Hmm. The toast of New York City's poetesses. <laughs> a literary lion at last. I shall never forget the morning when I was summoned to the drawing room to receive Mr. Poe. Ah, distinctly I remember. It was in the bleak December. With his proud and beautiful head erect, his dark eyes flashing with the electric light of feeling and of thought, a peculiar and irresistible blending of sweetness and hauteur in his expression and manner. And each separate ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. From that moment until his death, we were friends. Eagerly, I wished the morrow. Vainly, I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow. Sorrow for the lost Lenore. For the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. <laughs> Quoth the raven. <laughs> Nevermore. <laughs> New York, Morning Express, December the 15th, 1846. Illness of Edgar A. Poe. We regret to learn that this gentleman and his wife are both dangerously ill with the consumption and that the hand of misfortune lies heavy upon their temporal affairs. We are sorry to mention the fact that they are so far reduced as to be barely able to obtain the necessities of life. Kindest, dearest friend. My poor Virginia still lives, although failing fast, and now suffering much pain. Here, once, through an alley titanic of Cypress, I roamed with my soul of Cyprus, with Psyche, my soul. These were days when my heart was volcanic, as the scoriac rivers that roll, as the lavas that restlessly roll their sulfurous currents down Yannick in the ultimate climbs of the pole, that groan as they roll down Mount Yannick in the realms of the boreal pole. talk had been serious and sober, but our thoughts, they were palsied and sere. Our memories were treacherous and sere, for we knew not the month was October, and we marked not the night of the year. Ah, night of all nights in the year. We noted not the dim lake of Orba, though once we had journeyed down here, remembered not the dank tarn of Orba, nor the ghoul-haunted woodland of Weir. pacified Psyche and kissed her and tempted her out of her gloom and conquered her scruples and gloom and we passed to the end of the vista but were stopped by the door of a tomb by the door of a legended tomb and I said what is written sweet sister on the door of this legended tomb she replied Ula loom, ula loom, tis the vault of thy lost ula loom. A 
A complete nervous collapse. You never left your bed. Almost as dead as she. I was deserted. Deserted in death again. First, mother. And now, Virginia. But there was Mrs. Clem to run the household and your literary errands. Huh. What a part to play. The grieving husband, the mourning son-in-law. I was past all parts then. There was no regular employment. Just writing, writing, writing. I saw thee once, only once, years ago. I must not say how many, but not many. It was a July midnight, and from out a full-orbed moon that, like thine own soul, soaring, sought a precipitate pathway up through heaven, there fell a silvery, silken veil of light, with quietude and sultriness and slumber upon the upturned faces of a thousand roses that grew in an enchanted garden. My friend, was this not mere play-acting? The first scene of a last and desperate act. This Helen Whitman you addressed in verse was no Virginia, but a 45-year-old widow with a mother determined to fight off all adventurers. And your second choice after being rejected elsewhere. Dupin, reason has chilled your heart. Your blood runs icy. I needed a companion, balm for my soul, a sure refuge against the terrors of the night. Marriage, Poe. Marriage. Will Dr. Crocker have the kindness to publish the bands of matrimony between Mrs. Sarah Helen Whitman and myself on Sunday and on Monday? We passed the greater part of the day in making preparations for my sudden change of abode. In the afternoon, while we were together in one of the circulating libraries of the city, a communication was handed me, cautioning me against this imprudent marriage and informing me of many things in Mr. Poe's recent career with which I was previously unacquainted. Helen, you allude to your having been tortured by reports which have all since been explained to your entire satisfaction. Well, on this point, my mind is fully made up. I will rest neither by night nor day until I bring those who have slandered me into, into the light of day. I was at the same time informed that Mr. Poe had already violated the solemn promises that he had made to me and to my friends. He earnestly endeavored to persuade me that I had been misinformed especially in relation to his having that very morning called for wine at the bar of the hotel where he bought it. I had now learned that my influence was unavailing. One night, returning home much intoxicated from one of my haunts about town, I fancied that the cat avoided my presence. I seized him when, in his fright at my violence, he inflicted a slight wound upon my hand with his teeth. The fury of the demon instantly possessed me. I knew myself no longer. My original soul seemed at once to take its flight from my body, and a more than fiendish malevolence, Jim Merchant, thrilled every fiber of my frame. I took from my waistcoat pocket a penknife, opened it, grasped the poor beast by the throat. <laughs> I fled in vain. My evil destiny pursued me as if in exaltation. In an absolute frenzy of wrath, I turned. Villain, you shall not dog me unto death. I will stab you where you stand. I was frantic with every species of wild excitement and felt within my single arm the energy and force of a multitude. I plunged my sword with brute ferocity, repeatedly, through 
and through his bosom. A large mirror now stood where none had been perceptible before. And as I stepped up to it, in extremity of terror, mine own image, but with features pale and dabbled in blood, advanced toward me with a feeble and tottering gait. Thus it appeared, I say, but it was not. It was my antagonist who stood there before me in the agonies of his dissolution. But, but I could have fancied that I myself was speaking. You have conquered, and I yield. Yet, henceforward, art thou also dead, dead to the world, to heaven, and to hope. In me didst thou exist, and in my own death. See by this image, which is thine own, how utterly thou hast murdered thyself. That was the last I saw of my friend. Never more would we walk through the Paris night, talking of matters that touch the deepest corners of the heart and the head. But I heard of Poe, and I have striven in this, the concluding chapter of a brief memorial to my best of friends, to make some sense of that last mysterious journey he undertook in June of 1849. The storm subsided. The heart beat easier. Poe reached Richmond, frightened enough to join the Sons of Temperance. And then that great heart beat a quicker tempo. Here, in Richmond, alive and widowed, was Elmira Royster. I was a child and she was a child, in this kingdom by the sea. I am a child, and she is a child. I and my Annabel Lee. He begged me when he was going away to marry him. Is this no more than the product of a fevered brain, an over-exercised imagination? Where's the sense in it? No sense in Baltimore when Poe arrives en route for New York. The city is gripped with election fever. Sir, there is a gentleman rather the worse for wear at Ryan's Fourth Ward polls who goes under the cognomen of Edgar A. Poe and who appears in great distress and says he's acquainted with you and I assure you he's in need of immediate assistance. When brought to the hospital he was unconscious of his condition. He remained in his condition from five o'clock in the afternoon until three the next morning. I am a child and you are a child. See by this image, which is thine own, how utterly thou hast murdered thyself. By the sea, a kingdom, a kingdom. Virginia, Virginia. His face was pale, but his whole person drenched in perspiration. We were unable to induce tranquility before the second day after his admission. We know he has no money. He's repeatedly told Maria Clem that he cannot send her even one dollar. There is an election in progress. 
a corrupt election with multiple voting. So, a first hypothesis. Poe has been bribed with drink to vote early and to vote often. When no longer able to walk, he is left in the gutter. But it won't do. Now, why was he wearing a suit of clothes that were not his own? He was robbed while lying drunk in the gutter. No, it won't do. Why is he still clutching a silver-headed cane he had borrowed earlier? He had sold his clothes for drink. No. Surely not the fastidious, pin-neat Edgar Poe. The delirium returned. Another at three in the morning on Sunday, 7th October, 1849. Lord, help my poor soul. He had wanted to die. He needed to die. There was scarcely anyone in the audience to applaud him. And that suit that had replaced his familiar black garb. A costume for the final act and the curtain fall. One last part. The perfect part. Because it can never be repeated. He had already written it for himself. Many years before. From that chamber and from that mansion I fled aghast. The storm was still abroad in all its wrath as I found myself crossing the old causeway. Suddenly, there shot along the path a wild light, and I turned to see whence a gleam so unusual could have issued, for the vast house and its shadows were alone behind me. The radiance was that of the full, setting, and blood-red moon, which now shone vividly through that once barely discernible fissure. While I gazed, this fissure rapidly widened became a fierce breath of the whirlwind. The entire orb of the satellite burst at once upon my sight. My brain reeled as I saw the mighty walls rushing asunder. There was a long, tumultuous shouting sound like the voice of a thousand waters. The deep and dank tarn closed sullenly and silently over the fragments of the House of Usher. In that tale of mystery and imagination, Kerry Shale played Edgar Allan Poe with John Moffat as Charles Auguste Dupin. Also taking part were Melinda Walker, Joe Dunlop and Michael Graham Cox. The Strange Case of Edgar Allan Poe was written and compiled by Christopher Cook and directed by John Powell.